Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Ann Ford, Roosevelt trustee and co-chair of the Women's Leadership Council. Thank you for joining us to celebrate Women's uh, History Month. The Women's Leadership Council is excited to host a series of events uh, that are going to uplift and celebrate the achievements of women during this Women's History Month. For those who might be new to the council, we formed in 2019 to support the personal and professional growth of women through intentional programming such as this. We identify critical issues that women still face while facilitating solutions to close that gender gap. Today, we spotlight three inspiring women alumni who have flipped the script handed to them by society and hold fulfilling leadership roles in their fields. We hope they inspire you as much as they have inspired us. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Sandra Frank. Sandra is an associate professor of history and the director of the Women's and Gender Studies program at Roosevelt University. She teaches a diverse range of courses on topics such as the historical memory of the Civil War, the power of popular culture, the use of oral history in creating community histories, and history, gender, and race in the Atlantic world. Sandra, thank you for joining us today to moderate the Council's first event of the month. And thank you, Anne. It's an honor to be here today. And as a historian, I think it's important to point out that setting aside a month to honor women was a long fought battle. At first in 1911, we got a day. In 1977, we got a week. And since 1987, we have had a month. One of these days, we'll get all 12 months. But until then, I think Women's History Month is a wonderful opportunity for us to pause, to be deliberate about celebrating where we've been, what we're doing now, and contemplating where we need to go from here. And I can't think of a better way to do that than to talk with the distinguished alumni uh, on our panel today. So I'm going to present their bios first slowly because they have all done a lot and then we will start our discussion. So first I wanna introduce Phyllis Cavallone Jurek, who is the executive director of Ladder Up. Ladder Up is a nonprofit organization that provides low income, hardworking people with free financial consulting resources that help them secure the opportunities they need to move up the economic ladder. Previously, Phyllis served as the chief of academics and co-interim leader for the Office of Catholic Schools for the Archdiocese of Chicago. So welcome, Phyllis. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Antu Siegel, who is an early career psychologist and board certified in clinical health psychology by the American Board of Professional Psychology. Currently, Dr. Siegel works at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan in the Transplant Institute. There she facilitates pre-surgical psychological evaluations for liver recipients and living kidney donors. So welcome, Dr. Siegel. Thank you. And final, we have Dr. Joanne Joss, who is a board certified infectious disease physician at St. Louis University and a clinician with specific expertise in human immunodeficiency virus infection. Dr. Joss also serves as the medical director of the outpatient clinic, the director of the antimicrobial stewardship program and the Associate Program Director of the Fellowship Training Program. So welcome, Joanne. Thank you so much. And thank you for all joining us in this discussion. I'm excited to jump into it. And to get us started, I thought I'd have all of you answer our first question. And that is, you know, what led you to your career path? And how did you discover your talents and meld your talents with your interests? Uh, so perhaps we could start with you, Joanne? Sure. 
So I am one of those really unusual people who decided very early on what they were going to do and then, you know, didn't see sense or change their mind over the course of time. Um, so I grew up in Zambia in the mid 1990s. My dad is a physician and I was one of those precocious children who was like taken to work and sort of left in the back room. And of course, I did not stay there. So the work that I saw my dad and his colleagues doing and the impact of the HIV epidemic in Zambia in the early to mid 90s at the time, that made a really big impression on me. And so I knew really early that I wanted to become a doctor and I probably wanted to work on HIV. And then over time, I realized I did have a talent for medicine. I um, like science and I really like people. So the science and art of medicine kind of came together in my personality and my skills and my interests. I'm really detail oriented, but I don't have trouble keeping track of the big picture. That is naturally a very nice thing to have for an ID doctor, although you can also be taught how to do that. Um, I read Pathologies of Power when I was at Roosevelt, actually, when I was 21. Um, it's by Paul Farmer, who very recently passed away. And it like really had a transformative effect on how I thought about medicine. So I'm most interested in the care of underserved populations. Working with those populations broadened my concept of how health systems work. Reading about that led me to think about public health and social determinants of health and health inequity and social justice. And then knowing more about all of that made me a more effective patient advocate and physician. So I got an MPH and I moved toward leadership in response to kind of everything that I had learned. Um, what I do know brings together like kind of all of that, right? Like, so what I do now is a commitment to service, medicine as a profession rather than a job, public health work, healthcare systems and processes work, and like healthcare leadership that really focuses on the most underserved and most vulnerable populations. Wow, that is inspiring. I, I love the fact that, you know, from an early age, you were inspired towards this path and also that really social justice was rooted very much in your in the early years and all through your education and profession. That's amazing. Uh, maybe Phyllis, we could turn to you next. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, so I have to admit, um, I wanted to be an educator when I was younger. I started out thinking that was just fine. I didn't even think about leadership. I was a junior high and high school mathematics teacher for many years and I was quite content. I ran things like the math team and had, you know, my, my guys go out and uh, we would compete and it was a lot of fun. And maybe because I seemed to have a head for numbers or, and budgeting and whatnot, I began to be asked by the administration at the time to help out with doing things like the school budget, planning, um, things if you remember at the high school level called scheduling, which was very uh, rooted in algorithms and whatnot. And the tasks kept growing and then I stood back and I went, Hmm. <laughs> I'm seeming to do a lot of these things. Some were technical and some were adaptive. And I thought, you know what? Um, you know, let, let me take a look here at what's going on. And um, for the most part, I seem to enjoy that work. I en enjoyed looking at it a little bit more outside of like the uh, five to six classes that I happen to work with every day. I liked impacting a school. I liked impacting understanding how it could impact the community. If you raise a school, you raise the community and that impact. Um, so I um, went to Roosevelt and I um, moved on to that level and became a principal. And over time, you know, uh, about 14 years later, I moved on to the, to the diocese at, at our like district level. And I enjoyed that work and that impact of really um, Looking at things using my experience from both levels, just as a really ground level and then school level, community based and, and really making, I think, quality decisions um, that impact uh, kids. Um, and now I'm, I'm you know, real, kind of putting all those skill sets together, overseeing a nonprofit. And I, I, I notice what has kept together. Um, the common theme is really that my personal values have always aligned to my work. And that really is very joyful because then it doesn't feel quite like work. Um, it feels like I am doing something that really resonates because um, it's hard to get up every day. Um, you know, I, I'm at that age <laughs> where if you don't really find joy in your work and feeling like you're, you're giving back at, at a certain level, um, it, can, it could probably wear on you. And so I can honestly say that um, those two pieces really align and I'm happy about that. Yeah, I think that that is something that's so valuable to consider, you know, how you can really take your interests and the, and the values that you hold and really put mm -hmm. them towards a career. And I appreciate the, the evolution that you've uh, explained, you know, about how you went through finding your path. 
Um, Dr. Siegel, I know that you know you were earlier in your career. So what what can you share with us about your path? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I had kind of a, a road that twisted and winded around. So in college, you know, I majored in psychology and biology, which really allowed me to further learn about the connection between the mind and the body, which was truly fascinating to me. Um, after college, I wasn't too sure where I wanted my life to go. Um, I'm sure I know uh, talking with my mom at the time, she was a little terrified, but I was like, I'm going to take a year off. I'm going to figure it out. Don't worry. Uh, I decided to do a year of service with AmeriCorps. Um, and that's what actually led me to the Midwest. I was placed on the west side of Chicago and I worked as a healthy lifestyle coach, which at the time was very challenging because it was a food desert and we were essentially educating the community about healthy living. Um, that year truly emphasized on me the reality of the disparities in health and mental health care. And that's where I decided, hey, I love Chicago. I want to stay here. I went to grad school. I applied to grad school at Roosevelt. I got in um, and I decided to pursue this career path in psychology. Um, but within um, my training experiences, I also did some twists and turns. I decided, oh, I want to try this field of psychology. I want to try this field of psychology. And through our practica and then on internship, a fellowship, I was really gladly able to identify, hey, I want to work in the health system, right? I want to help people manage um, and cope with chronic health conditions. And so now I'm a clinical health psychologist. I am early career. So I uh, finished fellowship back in 2016. Um, so just a few years of independent work here, um, but I help people manage the impact that health has had on their day to days, right? Um, addressing adherence concerns, assessing for cognitive dysfunction that might impact health, really treating the adjustment related anxiety, depression that comes with managing um, the whole body. And so um, I think even though I've had twists and winds, um, I found that uh, treating the whole person, the mind and the body is truly important to me. And I really love what I do. And I really hope to do it for many years to come. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you are all so inspiring. I, um, and I feel like all of you have been able to meld your service interests with your professions. I think that's just fantastic. Uh, the next two questions I have are about leadership. And the first has to do with whether there's been a particular experience or a defining moment in your career where you began to see yourself as a leader. Uh, that's kind of a big question, but I, let's tackle it. Does anyone want to go first? I'm happy to go first. So I actually have a very specific defining moment, which is interesting. So I was in a room with a patient and he had been released from prison without his psychiatric medications or his HIV drugs. And so he was really in the grip of a psychotic break. Like he couldn't tell reality from not reality. We were in the room together. He was not convinced that I wasn't going to harm him. And in the middle of like kind of our, about five minutes into it, he took out a gun that was definitely loaded and he contemplated like using it. So we're in this room together. I can't get out because of the configuration of the room. And I was really worried what would happen if I loudly called for help or if someone accidentally walked in into this situation where he is like not in touch with reality. So I spent about 45 minutes like talking him into giving me the weapon. Um, and so we had this like very interesting discussion. To date, it is the best medicine I have ever practiced to like persuade this person through his delusion to like give me his weapon. And then I went to a meeting where I was in a room with about seven men. So it was all men in this meeting except for me um, and I had to like kind of explain what had happened and ask for what I thought would be best um, to deal with the situation and it was just um you know, like it wasn't the patient's fault in any way. And there were two perspectives in that room. About half the men in that room were like, well, this person should not have brought a weapon to our clinic. We need to ban him from our clinic forever. That to me did not make any sense. It's, it's not his fault. He is needing the gun because he's living really rough and living under bridges and has needed protection before from people who have threatened him with violence or actually done violence to him. And he's not responsible for what just happened. He, he is not responsible in any way. So to me, that was like a truly insane thing to say that we're, he needs help, but we're like not going to give him the help that he needs. And then the other half of the men in the room were, were really kind of characterizing my response as hysterical. That was the actual word that was used, which 
which as you know, has like a very loaded history when it's used to describe a woman's reaction to something. And they were like, well, you know, statistically the patient is much more likely to experience violence than you are, which is a true statement, does not change that he could have killed me or someone else with his weapon. And so as we're going through this discussion, it's immensely frustrating because nobody in that room can understand that my gender, my race and my tiny stature, I know you can't see it on this like video, but I'm like barely five feet tall. That influences my safety calculus and the patient's like kind of threat level that he sees from me in a different way than a, a man who is much larger or more intimidating in appearance um, or, a, or a white man because this patient was not white. So that there was just like a complete lack of understanding of kind of the intersectionality that was going on in that room. And I also felt like what I wanted, I felt like that was best for everyone involved. So what I wanted was to keep seeing the patient, but expedite his access to psych services and then reconfigure our safety stop so that we have like a panic button or a way to kind of type really quickly into the screen that we're looking at so that someone can be aware of what's going on in that room and not come rushing in but maybe very gently like knock on the door and come and help and so eventually I carried the day it took about three hours and it was very annoying but at the end of that I was like I have always thought that I don't have the diplomacy required to be a very good leader but my idea was a really good idea and at the end of it when I persuaded everyone that this is what we should do it made things better not not for me and for the patient alone, but for everybody, for everybody's safety. And so that was the first time that I was like, actually, I have a talent in this direction. I should probably try to develop it. Okay. I hope that we don't all have to go through such a dramatic and possibly <laughs> traumatic experience to find our, our leadership. But I'm so appreciative of you sharing that story with us. Um, I'm interested in, in your use of the word diplomacy, too, to describe um, like kind of how you evaluated what leadership meant and, you know, and, and how we kind of, I don't know, step onto the stage, you know, like what, what we bring of our personality. Yeah, I think partly because of my cultural upbringing and because medicine is so hierarchical, I had been trained to think of, of leaders, especially women leaders, as these people who like kept the peace or were very careful about how they like played this game. And I don't I don't do any of that. I'm very straightforward in what I say and do. I am extremely honest um, when I'm expressing myself. And so I had been sort of conditioned during the long years of my medical training to think that 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 characteristic, that ability to like kind of be very honest and straightforward and like to the point that that was not a desirable quality in a leader. So it was really interesting. I agree with you that like what I was thinking was really far off from what an effective leader actually is, but it came from all of this social conditioning in my field around what women leaders look like. Sure. And the fear that if you are assertive, then that word assertive associated with women is somehow defined differently um, and and uh, not appreciated, <laughs> certainly. So, yeah. Well, um, Dr. Siegel, do you want to uh, share? Yes, definitely. Um, so, you know, when I was thinking and reflecting on this question, I, I really realized that up to about three years ago, I didn't think of myself as a leader. Uh, part of that being, you know, being on residency and then being on fellowship and then just like, you know, you're still a trainee until you're out there in the world. But about three years ago, I took my second position um, after fellowship as the health psychologist within an interdisciplinary team with a uh, liver transplant team specifically. And I quickly learned that I needed to be a leader and I needed to hone my skills as a leader because I was the only behavioral health expert on the team, right? And I still am the only behavioral expert on the team. So I really realized the importance of my leadership, of helping inform the treatment recommendations, um, you know, requirements for successful post-transplant outcomes. And it's really the first time I saw myself as a leader. And it was a very exciting experience uh, because I really could see how I could grow with my team as an early career psychologist when a lot of my team members are older men. And so it had its struggles and I'm still learning every day on how to communicate effectively and how our communication styles are all different. But that was really the first time I saw myself as a leader. And you know that's a, a, a unique position I think that you're in where you do have a, a medical team. So people mm -hmm. from many different of fields, you know, and, and high, there's hierarchy there, but then you're a team and you're working together. So yeah, I can imagine that's a, a, a challenge yeah. and an opportunity. Exactly, and we know that the interdisciplinary work is what best serves our patients. And so we really, again, have to think about the whole person when we're treating them. Well, thank you. So uh, Phyllis, what do you wanna share? Oh, so um, 
I kind of told you a little bit about my journey just becoming a school building principal and early in my educational leadership at this particular school, um, I, it came to my attention that the sweet school was um, slated for closure. Um, we were low enrolled, we were high in debt, we had a lot of issues going on and they felt that it was just insurmountable. Um, in fact, we were uh, so poor, um, to my shock as an educational administrator, um, people can do things like shut off your utilities. Yes, they could shut off the, the heat of a school building. My phones were shut off and the building got so cold over um, the Christmas holiday um, because of a surprise closure once again that a pipe burst and uh, you know we couldn't even have the kids come back um, right after break. We had to delay it. So it was really a lot to think about. And um, so I broke it out into kind of chunks. First was, um, I'm like, this school was so important to the community. I just could not accept that it could be closed without a fight and me just doing the best I could. And so I really rallied the community and the, the current parents and whatnot. And we raised the funds to create stability. We worked with another nonprofit um, whose dedication was to um, to schools and just kind of bringing in partners. Um, so it became like all in from the community, which was very unique. It wasn't my fight. It was a rally of everybody coming together and I helped pull that together, which I, I really um, felt good about because then it was a, also a fast track for me to really understand and, gr and grow within the community too. It was um, everybody coming together saying, this is, this is not, going to happen here. Um, and so we, we, we got what we needed. We didn't have the school closed, which was great. But then the second phase, which was, um, what can, what can I do here so that we wouldn't face this the next year? Like that was not something you could live with um, every year. And I looked and I, I, it came to my realization that we needed to make the school so relevant in the community and, and Chicago where, it could just, that wasn't even a, something anybody could think of. Um, so we worked really hard uh, raising academic standards, success and whatnot. So from a school that was barely te teetering on, uh, just kind of keeping its doors open, we, um, we won a national blue ribbon. Uh, we got uh, recognized in the, uh, from Washington DC several times in one year. Um, we, won academic competitions left and right and really brought an awareness. Um, and that slowly brought in other families and what have you. We had a really great something. And, you know, it, it also brought in stability for the community. And I, I feel really proud that I was part of that. So um, I ended my tenure there uh, bringing in another national blue ribbon, which is like something like 0.1% of the schools in the nation do receive. So it, it was quite an accomplishment to not just um, bring that home once, but twice. Uh, and, and, that, and that was key. And instead of saying, you know, I got to continue to rebuild every year, let's just build it and have people come. Um, that was a very successful reign uh, for me. And I look at that uh, period of time, which was probably three, four years in total um, from that start where the pipe burst and the utilities were turned off to where we were just sitting. And uh, we didn't even have to recruit anymore. Uh, every time we had an open house, um, parents would be there and, 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 and we just had great, a great time. So I looked at that and I'm like, yeah, I mean, we could really make it a we in a community. So that was right. my particular moment. That's a, it's a powerful story too, because I, I do think that, you know, schools, I, are so many of them are fighting for resources and trying to mm -hmm. kind of limp along, like you say, every year yeah. trying to, you know, put up the fight and to create that stability for a community is just, is really key, you know, because those schools are the root of the community, I think. They are. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Um, you know, to kind of, some of you, have you have already somewhat raised this, but maybe we can get into this a little bit more about the ways maybe that your cultural identity or your upbringing have shaped your perspective on leadership and, you know, if so, how? Um, maybe, Dr. Siegel, maybe we can start with you this time. Is that all right? Yeah, definitely. 
Um, so, you know, our perspective um, changes over time. And I think that the things that I realized as a child, as an adolescent, as a young adult, you know, uh, continues to shift. Um, you know, I, I came to this country at a really young age. I'm an immigrant. I'm a Latina. I'm a first generation student. And so that all those cultural identities, all those parts of my identity really shape my perspective. Um, and I know that I have a unique voice based on these experiences and I want to use that voice. Um, really, my first leadership mentor was my mom. You know, she's a, a strong woman who did sacrifice a lot to get me where I am today. And I want to emulate that strength as much as I can um, as a mentor for students who are like me, who um, have experiences that are similar to me, who have to overcome just a lot of barriers to pursue higher education. Um, you know, my, my, my experiences and my upbringing and the way I think about my culture really allows me, gives me the passion to speak up, to be that mentor. Because it's not easy being the only one um, or a small group of individuals who are really different from everyone else. Our perspective as women also is really interesting and very important as leaders to kind of shape advocacy efforts. You know, the legislation at all levels is um, really important to um, engage in. It's something I didn't really understand as an early career psychologist until I was embedded in my state psychological association. Um, and so I feel like there's all little pieces of my cultural identity and my upbringing that really shape who I am today and really allow me to be that mentor um, and being a woman a Latina in a leadership role I think is really important because representation is really important um, and I could go on and on but um, I think those are kind of the, the main points that I, I want to put across that are where we come from and how we think about our past really reflects on how what we can do in our future yeah and I think that you know the you raise the issue of representation and also the pressure though that also you know the you take on, you know, to. to I don't, it's not easy being the only one, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Phyllis, do you want to sure. speak to that? So, um, you know, I uh, definitely had some challenges growing up, and in, it, it was definitely complicated as well. So, my mother um, divorced when I was really, really young, and that spiraled us in, to be in a certain place that wasn't good financially. On the one hand, too, like the family was really quite traditional. We're Sicilian, and there was a lot of like this tug, of, tug a little bit to be traditional, which means housewife and mother. And um, yet, I was staring at the situation of which was not good for my mother and our family, and I was just not going to have it. I knew that the way out really was through education, and I. Um, no one can convince me otherwise that the only thing I had to work with were my two hands and my hard work, right? And so I took um, education really seriously. I was um, first first generation college bound. Um, few of my family at that particular time, it's different now, but at that time even graduated and uh, went through high school. Uh, and, you know, it, it just literacy was an issue. And so it was hard. Um, my mom could could help me only so much, but she really couldn't do the things like even I can do for my own kids now. Um, so I, I took it seriously and I kind of had a position of like, I'm going to be unassertively un unapologetic about being assertive of what I want. I'm going to be me, but I'm going to have this um, notion of why not me. And I still take that perspective now. Um, you know, I latched onto people I thought were good role models, whether they wanted me in their shadow or not of like, where I wanted to go and be. And um, I hope now I'm, I'm a bit of that for others in that journey. And I know my mom is proud of me today, but I it probably in her mind was not in her wheelhouse that I would not be that traditional um, woman uh, from from our culture. Uh, yet she's proud. It's just it, it's this interesting um, place, but it was the right thing. And you know, I, I love that um, it also shaped who I am as well. And I think in, in many ways has played a significant role in how I serve the communities that I do serve. Yeah. So first off, a shout out to both of you for your first gen successes. Um, and also, you know, I, I, I have students today who are who speak of, you know, the kind of the struggles of, um, you know, the, both the, the deep bonds they have with their families and also the, 
um, you know, maybe stepping outside of traditions, you know, and mm -hmm. the and the struggles that are that are really there. Yeah. So thanks, um, Joanne. Do you want to speak to this question? Yeah, so I'm also an immigrant. I came to the US when I was 12. I had lived on three different continents before I was 12. So like the kind of um, experience of traveling and being a global citizen in some sense, that really defined the way that I look at my work now. Um, and it really has me pay a lot of attention to systems because I've been in the immigration system for a very long time. And I understand how that has limited my possibilities and my ability to kind of do what I want. Um, that I, it has, I, get, I would say that it has imposed limits on my dreaming that do not belong there. And so having that experience really kind of puts me in a place where I can I can see that in other people's lives and I can help them work through it. Um, I also come from a very like community of Catholic, um, very strictly religious Catholic um, people in Kerala, which is in the south of India. And my my culture too is like extremely traditional. Women have very well-defined gender roles and being a doctor, especially a doctor who is a leader, that transgresses those norms, but it also provides a liminal identity for me that I've found very useful <laughs> during my time, um, kind of trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. So, and I think what it has really done for me, like that immigrant background and, and my parents who are both incredibly hard workers, but my mom who had five children and has like two master's degrees and is just one of the most amazingly hardworking people I know, putting all of that together, I think I went into leadership so that when I have power, I can give it to the people who are most in need of it. The people that nobody ever thinks about, the people who always get overlooked. And that is like a truly revolutionary evolutionary concept for most medical spaces. Like medicine is highly hierarchical. It's very top down. And so when you have a, a leader who looks like I look and then is also coming in being like, I want things to be different to benefit this group of people that nobody thinks about. I think that is um, like an extraordinary thing that is only possible because of my kind of background as a woman of color and an immigrant and working with extremely marginalized populations over time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, what I've noticed is that all of you are bringing in intersectional issues, which I just think are really crucial to think about. And so when I ask this next question, I want you to freely interpret it and ask it in any way you want, because um, it has to do with, you know, um, issues of gender bias or inequity in your field or like particular challenges of women. But, um, you know, however that that uh, resonates with you in your career, um, do, maybe Phyllis or Joanne, do you want to take that on, Phyllis? Sure. Um, so um, gender bias is, is, is still kind of there. Um, um, I've seen it in different kind of phases and stages throughout my career and still kind of see little sneak peeks of it. Um, and I think the biggest thing I, I would say under that is um, the assuming part. People still make a lot of assumptions. Um, so I'm both agentic and communal, and I could be that at the same time. But quite often, people assume that um, I smile, or I think I think I am relatively a kind person, that I can't stick up for myself or call things out, and um, even physically. Um, Joanne, you mentioned about height, stature. I'm, I'm a couple inches on you, but I'm still kind of petite. <laughs> um, but because I'm not the six foot tall Caucasian um, male, um, you know, it's not what they think coming into a room. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'm, I, I have two 20 something year old uh, sons who are six foot tall. Um, you know, it, it, it's fine. But leadership doesn't have to be this certain way and uh, fit in a box. And uh, my experiences, my culture, my upbringing, everything that is me has a lot of value. And I'm valuable and I'm valuable in my own right. Um, and so when I walk into a room, I mean, I've learned, I've learned, and I'm sure we all have here on the panel have learned a little bit, like you carry yourself a certain way and whatnot, because you easily can see how they go. And this has happened to me multiple times. One of the men on my staff, people will go to, and they'll stick their hand out and think they're the, the person, right? The, either the leader or whatnot. And, and it's like, oh, hi, no, I'm, I'm here. Hi, how can I help you? Um, and that, that tends to happen. Um, they, I, you know, they got to think and not assume, and they have to think broader than the box. Um, and so I, I'd say a lot of people bring so much to the table, and we have to look at people and all of what they bring, um, and we shouldn't forget that. Yeah, absolutely. Joanne, did you want to add? 
Yeah, I think um, we've had like similar experiences of gender bias. I'm sure every woman listening to this has. I will walk in sometimes and I'm I'm the attending. I'm like the lead of the team that's going in the room and people will look at my medical student who then will be like, "I she's the one in charge, like not me. You should not be asking me things, right? So it's, it's a really common experience. And I think in leadership circles as well, like I'll go into a room and I'll say something and I have to be so careful about how my tone is being perceived. Um, people use the word aggressive to me when a man will say the exact same thing and they will not use that word they'll say that's just like a really great idea mm -hmm. so I, I think our experience of gender bias is distressing in 2022 but still very much a fact of life i think when i was thinking about this question um there are two issues that i think really hold women physicians back and there's data to support this i was at id week in 2019 which is the large national infectious disease conference mm -hmm. and somebody presented a paper where they basically looked at pay disparities and advancement opportunities for women. And infectious disease, which is usually considered like a very fluffy, like kind field where everyone is nice to everyone else, had worse um, characteristics for both of those for pay equity as well as advancement opportunities than cardiology did. So it was just really a wake up call for the hundreds of people at this conference, both virtually and non-virtually, to be like, oh, we, we have some work to do in our house. So I think pay equity for women is absolutely essential. And we don't get there without talking about our salaries first. So, you know, having male colleagues be transparent about what they're paid and how they negotiate is a really important step to helping women achieve that parity, especially in a field like medicine where your reputation is really important. And so it actually does have negative consequences for women to bargain hard or to kind of negotiate aggressively without the support of um, nationalized standard, standardized surveys of pay and things like that. And then the other thing is that in academic medicine, women are not allowed to advance the way that men are. Women represent over 50% of medical students in the country, and they represent a vanishingly small number of leadership positions. So what we are doing is creating women doctors and then denying them the opportunity to actually advance in their field. And a lot of that has to do with women taking time for children or family that is viewed as like a negative thing to do and it absolutely needs to stop like that attitude needs to go away and it really should have gone away a long time ago and then i think giving women who are clinician educators the same opportunities to to advance as women who are researchers is going to be really important as well because a lot of women right now occupy leadership in clinician educator spaces but maybe not in the traditional nih funded research space and both of those things are incredibly valuable. The healthcare system does not work without both of those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so, you know, uh, all of you seem are forging these paths that have not been, you know, well-worn. You're, you're really st stepping out. And um, so I'm curious to know, are there unseen supporters that have helped you? Have you been able to find mentors in your field or have you had to search through other professional networks to um, find, you know, people that um, have helped you attain the success that you, that you have achieved. Yeah, I think it's been it's been a little challenging because there sometimes when you're the first of a particular kind or like an un, unusually small number of a particular kind, it's really hard to find other people who are exactly like you. So the answer to that is to find people who have some element of what you're looking for that can support you. This isn't possible. Every woman who has a leadership position, she has like all of her sisters behind her, like carrying her forward and, and giving her advice. So I've been really lucky in my career that women have taken me under their wing. Men have too. Like there are a lot of people who have just been like, I see what you're trying to do here and I believe in it. So let me invest my time, my effort, my advice. Like, here's my phone number. Here's my email. Let's go to, to coffee or lunch or dinner. I want this to work for you because I think for, for many people, and this is certainly true of me as well when I choose mentees, the reason that I'm doing this, the reason I do exactly what I do is because I believe in it. I believe it's really important. And it doesn't happen if I'm the only one doing it. Like there have to be other people like me. So what when I choose mentees, I choose women of color predominantly, and then I help connect them to the networks that they need to be able to come forward as well. And sometimes just having someone who you can say, I had this experience, I think it was a microaggression, it was deeply unpleasant for me. Can you just listen to what I experienced and like maybe validate that what I experienced is not crazy or weird or whatever. Can, can we just like talk about how this happens to us and men in this position do not have to worry about it? 
Yeah. I love what you said that I want to piggyback. Like I don't want someone um, just to problem solve when I need to talk. Sometimes I just need to recap and have someone kind of be a sounding board so that we can navigate the experience that I just had. And uh, women most often, but not exclusively, can kind of help help do that and have done that. Um, you know, you, having great partner friends even have been really wonderful. So even outside of that professional space, I've been lucky to have some amazing rock stars in that area. But um, I, I have to say and do kudos to a couple of wonderful friends who know um, to listen when it's just you need to vent and that's all and no judgment on it because women uh, bear quite often quite a lot of judgments from everything you know we can't even open a magazine or click on something without seeing something of what we should should be doing and kind of in, infiltrating that so um and yeah I, I i i say we need to give back that energy to the universe as well um I encourage every woman li listening when you when you've arrived or where you are around the journey, bring along put, put the the hand that helped lift you, put the hand down and bring along as many um, young women that you you can uh, either in an like uh, kind of a organized way, whether it's a school or professional entity organization or what have you, or just informally. Um, you'd be surprised. Uh, even when you think no one's looking, people are looking and you probably are a mentor in some way, even if it's not formal. So just take a look around you. People yeah. want to be you or want to hear about you. <laughs> right. uh, Dr. Siegel, I'm sure that I'm wondering if you have a um, particular perspective being new in your career or, you know, have you had to, is this a, a new navigation you're doing? Yeah, no, definitely. I, I mean, I've had wonderful mentors throughout my graduate training and beyond, uh, some professional and some more personal. So, uh, you know, I, I think that some of the mentors that I've had thus far, you know, they, uh, they motivate me to continue to grow, to continue to challenge myself with new adventures that I might not have thought about in the past. Um, particularly, you know, I was, uh, I was asked to join the Michigan Psychological Association and I was chair of a committee for a few years, and then they asked me to run for president-elect, and I was like, whoa, I'm not sure I can do this. Um, I, I don't have any leadership experiences. This is the right fit for me. Um, but without those mentors, um, the people also in my personal life that motivated me to do those things and saying, you're going to be great. We have your back. We're going to support you along the way. What do you need? You know, um, kind of bouncing off ideas about what I wanted to be as a president um, for this large, you know, State Psychological Association was just a little intimidating um, to pursue, but I'm really happy I did so. Um, and so the role of the value of mentorship is huge. Um, and like the other panelists have said, it's you know trying to help those that now that I'm in this experience, even though I'm still early career, I want to help people get to where I am. Um, and having leaders in our field who are like us, who have experienced similar things, again, because that representation is really important, it's good to then extend that hand. Um, and I'm trying to do that now by creating kind of this leadership pipeline so that early career psychologists can also be part of leadership roles because our voice is unique, you know, as young leaders also. Right. Right. And it's continuous, too. I, I, I hear all of you suggesting that, you know, you sought out um, people that could mentor you early in your careers. And that doesn't change even as you take on more and more leadership roles. It's still good to have a network of um, a community of, of people that you can help navigate, you know, new issues and just get support. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, we might start bringing in questions from the audience, uh, but I'm, I want to ask this question because it fits so well with all of your fields. And that has to do with the fact that all of you are uh, working with people that have um, experienced suffering or trauma or that are trying to navigate difficulties in their lives. And that can really, I think, raise the issue of compassion fatigue. And so does anyone want to address how how um, you and your professional career or how women specifically and women leaders navigate that and how um, you stay motivated to um, keep that, that fight. 
put yourself in the equation, everybody, you know, you have to take some time. Sometimes it's easier before you even uh, go out the door to take care of others, just to make sure, you know, you take care of yourself. Um, maybe right. it's at the end of the day, wherever it is, try and make sure you're part of the equation. You won't be able to take care of others the way you want to, the way your heart wants to, if you don't put yourself as part of the equation. You know, you need to eat right, you need to have decent sleep, and you need to, to move in simple terms. Um, and, you know, you, you need laughter around you as well. Um, and, and those kinds of things um, will creep up on you. And one day you wake up if you don't do those things and, you, you know, you won't like necessarily what you see. So um, women, it's hard sometimes um, in some ways to say no. Uh, you don't need to say, you just need to look at the landscape differently and how you can uh, take some time to make sure you, you are cared for by you right. yeah self-care and i think a little work-life balance here yeah drawing out there yeah yeah um, i would say this as well um you know compassion fatigue i think has become a hot topic since the beginning of covid 19 pandemic though it, it's not a new concept um right. we we're seeing right now higher rates of depression and anxiety um, among you know society at large, particularly healthcare staff and particularly frontline providers, you know people in the emergency departments in the ICUs, um, and compassion fatigue affects all of us. It's a real thing. It affects our quality of life. Um, for those that are listening that do work in healthcare settings, you know a lot of hospital systems have wellness programs and they have peer-to-peer -peer support, which is invaluable in times of high stress. Um, you know when. when Thinking about this, uh, what do I do, you know, to navigate these stressors, um, engagement in self-care, you know, wellness activities, uh, exercising, making sure I schedule time for myself mm -hmm. um, to engage in activities that really bring me joy um, and reaching out to my community, right? Um, reaching out to my friends, the people who can listen to me, who kind of just put a shoulder and, and, and um, allow me that space to kind of process and speak out loud what I'm feeling. Um, and then as a leader, I think I provide that space for my trainees, um, you know, to discuss the stressors, but also to support them when they are identifying concerns. Um, what really keeps me motivated and helps me at work, particularly when I'm feeling fatigued and, you know, you want to, you have to see a lot of patients and you have to do a lot of things, but the world is so heavy right now, um, is really practicing mindfulness techniques, being present in the moment without judging myself on how I'm doing has really helped me. Yeah, I think the last two years, I would agree with you, have been like truly horrific for compassion fatigue in the healthcare industry. It's just been so hard for people, like all of your, um, the immediacy and the urgency of what you do, and then just the, the kind of wearing down of low staffing ratios and, um, you know, the danger that you face at work all the time, sometimes really terrible behavior from from um, patients and their families. So it's just been a, a really hard time for the last couple of years. And I think I'm really glad that we're calling it compassion fatigue and not burnout, because I think it's a much better descriptor um, of what is actually happening. And for me, this is really interesting because I care a lot about healthcare systems and processes and, and compassion fatigue. The roots of it are in systems. It's not an individual level problem. It's, it's a larger level problem. And so for me, there's things that I do for myself, like you guys were saying, I have um, measures for separating my work and my life that are extremely strict and I've occasionally like someone has you know tried to violate that boundary and I'm militant about maintaining it because for me and for my wellness I need to have that boundary and I'm um, I'm available 150% when I'm at work but when I'm not at work I am not available and that is like a very strict boundary that I maintain and my field does allow me to do that like there's very few things that I'm like urgently called in for in the middle of the night and things like that um, and then I think I have um, a monitoring system for me as well. Like the way that I think about it is I've put a lot of time, effort, energy, and I guess money into becoming a physician, which means that I did this because I really cared about it and I want to keep doing it for the next 30 years. And that isn't going to be possible if I'm not monitoring myself for problems before they become so big that I can't solve them on my own. So I have like a system for monitoring myself for burnout. I encourage every mentee to develop that for them, whatever that looks like for them. And then to have a tiered intervention if they ever notice that they're having 
different problems. So the first set might be reaching out to your friends and colleagues and um, doing activities that bring you a lot of joy and caring for yourself. If things have gotten to the point where that's not enough, well then those wellness programs, therapy access, and I do a lot of work in my institution around destigmatizing access to therapy services and things like that for healthcare workers. There's a lot of worry and stigma around it because sometimes it can affect licensing depending on the state that you're in. And there's a lot of fear that if you seek, if you reach out for help, that your life is going to be like over, which of course is extremely counterintuitive and terrible. So there's a lot of advocacy being done around that to try and destigmatize seeking mental health resources. And then finally, when I'm approaching this with my leadership hat on, I build burnout prevention into every system and every team that I create and lead. So we are creating safe spaces where there's meetings where the, the only purpose is to kind of vent about what's really going on that's causing you frustration. It is a judgment-free space. You can say what you need to say and get it off your chest. And then at the end of that discussion, if there's one, one thing that multiple people are mentioning, well, then maybe that's a target for us to work on. And I think all of that is maybe just a result of uh, you being in that leadership position, you know, and all that you bring to the table and to your career. I think that's amazing. There's there's actually a, a audience question that I think we can kind of tag on to, to this issue of compassion fatigue, though it adds another element to it. And uh, it the question is, in the book, Breaking Through Bias, it talks about how concerning yourself too much with stereotype threats can be debilitating and can reduce your working memory. And so the question is, how do you navigate that on top of all of the technical work and, and mental health issues that you are navigating? I have to tell you, I have not read this book. So hopefully my answer will be like, reasonable, even though I haven't read the book. Um, I think for me, I have been in a couple of jobs now where my leadership uh, space, the, the space that I occupy as a leader, it's like, it feels like it's constantly besieged. You know, like there are people who are like, well, are you really right for this job? Aren't you too young? Um, is your perspective too whatever? Like, are you really sure that you know what you're doing? And so that has been really interesting to navigate because I am sure that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I wouldn't be doing it if I wasn't sure. Um, and so that has been really interesting as, as I try to like kind of navigate those spaces. And so what I found works really well for me, and you have to be so careful how you do it. So make sure that you have like a, a reasonable way of doing it. But I'll like call out their bias. So if I notice that someone is making an assumption about me, and I usually, you know, let them do it two or three times so I can be sure that that's what's happening. Um, but I've, I've actually had people like look me in the eye and be like, well, you're really different from like other Indian women. And I'm like, really? Is that is that because I'm really different from other Indian women or is it because you have a stereotype that you need to maybe do some work on? If I notice that I'm experiencing my, a microaggression, I will very gently point that out to the person I'm experiencing it from. I know that this is not what you intended. A microaggression is by definition an implicit act, like you're not doing it on purpose, but here's how I'm perceiving it. And I think that's really important information for you to have because if you're comfortable doing this to me without realizing it, you're probably doing it to other people who maybe don't feel safe bringing it up to you. Or if I notice that there's an implicit bias that characterizes my interactions with someone, I will very, very gently point out that that is what I'm noticing and let then the ball is in their court and they can tell me how they think it's actually, um, whether that's true or not true. And often people are like very defensive, in which case my response is, I'm not saying you did anything wrong or that you are not valuable. I usually lead it with, these are all the ways in which you are valuable but here's what I've noticed. And so this is a piece of feedback for you. You can choose what to do with it. It has nothing to do with me, what you decide to do. Right. Yeah, and you know that speaks to the need to really change workplace culture, right? And for all of us to stand up and, and intervene and speak out um, and, and reshape you know, what we want our workplaces to look like. Um, I wanna get in this question uh, uh, that it was asked by someone in the audience and also that we had on our, our list here, and it has to do with the advice that you would give, uh, you know, maybe a student at Roosevelt or an emerging professional in your field. And then to add the element of the audience question is, um, what advice do you have to overcome imposter syndrome? Which I think is something that, you know, especially people just starting out in their careers might, might feel. So that's a lot. I'll... 
Yeah, I, I could uh, answer a little bit of that. So um, I think some of my advice is to, you know, continue to do the amazing work that you're doing. You know, as you start off, you know, you have a lot of different ideas of what, you know, you want your career path to look like, but it doesn't always have to be linear, right? Um, mm -hmm. It can take those twists and those curves and you can start doing something and then you realize, oh, maybe this is not for me. And that's okay, right? Then you choose something else. So really while you're, you know, in school and you're on training, you're starting a new job, you know, trying to see what do you want to do um, and taking all those avenues um, uh, as much as you can. You know, learning and growing is difficult. Um, I think it's meant to be difficult, um, but it's worth the struggle. Um, mm -hmm. The imposter syndrome, uh, syndrome question is, uh, you know, something that I, I experienced, right, as an early career psychologist, it still kind of creeps in from time to time. But again, I tried to ground myself um, in knowing that, um, you know, I'm doing everything that I can, right? Again, kind of being mindful of myself without judgment, um, getting the help if I do realize, okay, maybe this is something I need a little bit more guidance on, just feeling okay to say, hey, I need help with this and finding those mentors that will allow you that space to continue to grow. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, Phyllis, did you wanna? Well, I, I hire an awful lot and <laughs> through my career and I could tell um, the entry level positions are coming in and wherever it is for somebody coming out of um, school. We've done your, our, our homework on you and um, typically as a hiring uh, agent, we either liked what we, we, we felt from an interview, what we saw on the resume, combination of sorts and, uh, you know, trust that we saw this possibility for you, this opportunity, and think, why not me, right? And um, even if it's not your perfect match, whose first job or first big job right out of uh, school is where they're going to land for the next 30 or 40 years. It's, it's make the most of it. Uh, ask a lot of questions. Ask for more responsibility if you feel you're, you're ready for it, or ask for clarity when you're a little unsure about it. Um, don't be shy about it, but know that um, somebody didn't offer you a, a position unless they really felt you were right. So if they believe in you, will you believe in you and and just try to go relax and, and acquire the space and get to know the environment and, and even get to know your colleagues and whatnot and make the most the most of it for the particular time that you're there um, and get something out of it, even if, if it's only maybe a year or two. Um, I, you know, I guarantee you, uh, they've seen something in you, and I'm sure you're going to just do great work. So, right. you know, put it aside. <laughs> I like that phrase, acquire the space, you know, fill it up. Like, you know, yeah, um, yeah I'm here. Great. <laughs> All right. Uh, Joanne, did you want to uh, close us off? We have just a minute left. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I think, two pieces of advice, and they're kind of linked to each other. So the first one is, outside of really basic realities, like I'm probably not going to be winning like gold medals for swimming at barely five feet tall. But outside of those basic realities, you are the one who defines what your possibilities are, not anybody else. Nobody else gets to tell you what your possibilities are. So you go through it and figure out, like, it does this seem like something I want? Does it seem like I have the talent for it? If it does, like, go for it. Like, there is no reason to not go for something that you want, as long as it's, you know, physically possible for you to achieve. And I think, and during that process, like, like Dr. Sagal said, if you need help, ask for it. It's an empowered thing to ask mm -hmm. for help when you need it, because it says that you know enough about what you're doing and what you want to, to know where the help is actually needed. And if you're not sure about something, like, talk it through with someone, be vulnerable in front of people and let them kind of help Help you figure out how to move on to the next step and then I think for me um, this is advice that I live by like I should know better than anybody else what my strengths and weaknesses are so I should not be in a position where I'm being surprised by feedback that I'm getting and also feedback does not need to be perfectly delivered in the way I want to receive it to be extremely useful so seek it out use it when you get it and like ask for it all the time because that is the way that we grow wise words right why not me Right. So um, we're unfortunately uh, at the end of our time together. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us. I'm going to bring back um, Ann Ford to uh, close us out. I think that she'll be joining us. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Sandra, thank you for uh, moderating this galvanizing discussion. And Phyllis, uh, Joanne and Antu, 
uh, you have been an inspiration to all of us. You've shown us what's possible uh, when we write our own stories. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, to hear and celebrate your achievements today. To our guests, we wanna thank you for tuning in. We hope that you will also join us Thursday, March 24th at 4 p.m. for the Women in Business panel. We have two uh, Women's Council Advisory Board members who will be talking about the roots of their success and offer advice to future business women. Uh, that panel is going to be moderated by a student, Maria Rivera, who is a current, um, currently a Roosevelt student and also a, a Deutsch Herzeg scholar. Uh, thank you again and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.